Jesus and bring to mind all the situations. Double the best that comes to mind for them where you need to say something so urgent and so well done. The traditional practice normally was that they turned the key and they overheard the deal. The same offers to share the action that makes things possible. The joy of human creation and a cultural life and presence is possible and brings meaning to the land and people of all the world to community. At the same time, we live in a fragile and violent world where it's not a case of inside. In the running up of the story of me, the people on this land and they continue to write this message to the world. Therefore, I declare as founders and directors from the end of the Mary Father's program to generously agree to share one of their own people with educational series so that our community can learn the truth about history and culture. This series is a place where the voice of the most care and empathy of people has to be known and has the final word on that. Looking from the series one through seven, we cover the life of each topic, including first his discussion today and where reality is at stake today. Mascots, logos, image, creation. recognizing indigenous people today, rather than those who colonized the land. Indigenous art and social change and indigenous playwrights and storytellers, including art, included artists from this region and from around the continent, presented their work and discussed and shared how they use their art for justice and voice particularly in regard to missing and murdered indigenous women. One panelist called this a revolution of the heart. The Living Present series is a call for truth. It is also a call for action, to look history in the face and see how we can heal the bleeding wounds. To ask for a commitment not only to listen and understand the story of these many people's but also share responsibility for that story to live fully into the present. And to make sure that erasure and disappearance gives way to reparation, decolonization of our minds and in our actions, sharing land, cultural space, and most of all, justice. I want to take the opportunity to thank HowlRound for broadcasting the Mass Cultural Council, Jacob Pillow, and local cultural councils, and particularly a sponsor of the Living Presence series, the Mass Foundation for the Humanities Expanding Stories program. Mm -hmm. The Okiteo team includes youth resident Nazario Tall Hair Red Deer Garate, Anoki Man. Samantha Dancing Star Woman Sylvester, Tracy Loving Medicine Eyes Ramos, Andres Strong Bearheart Games, and now to introduce the co founders and co directors of Okitao. Rhonda Anderson is Anupiak Adabaskan from Kaktovit. Her life work is most importantly as a mother, a classically trained herbalist, silversmith, and activist. She works fervently as an educator activist on the removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from extractive industry. And in that light, she is also the curator of the Living Presence series. Rhonda tirelessly works on representation from the state house to local schools and businesses, all the way to Charlemont. <laughs> <laughs> no 
<laughs> He's on the advisory board of DECA, was an advisor on decolonization efforts on the Mass Council for Arts, and most recently on the Philanthropy Mass 50 Second Meeting, as well as many, many, many panels. She is Commissioner of Indian Affairs in Western Mass and was named the Commonwealth Heroine of Mass. Larry Spotted Crowman is a citizen of the Nipmuc Nation. He is a nationally acclaimed award-winning writer, poet, and cultural educator, traditional storyteller, tribal drummer, dancer, and motivational speaker involving youth sobriety, cultural, and environmental awareness. Larry shares music, history, and culture to Nipmuc people and lectures on Native American sovereignty and identity regionally and internationally. Larry's books include Morning Road to Thanksgiving, Drumming and Dreaming, and The Whispering Basket. And Larry premiered his play Freedom in Season in the spring of this year and is currently making a film, Anoki, A Journey Beyond the Picture. He is on the review committee at the Native American Poets Project and Artist in Residence at uh, Bunker Hill Community College and writing a children's book series for Indigenous youth. Larry was the first Native to have shared a traditional Nipmuc song and land acknowledgement at the opening of the Boston Marathon since the Boston Marathon started happening. Um, Larry will now welcome you to the living presence of the history. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everybody, for sharing this time with us. Uh, I want to open my traditional words and say, Wu Natra Natumu Manatu, Tabati, Watu Chikindi, Sir, Okumis, Tabati Muchi Sapalsu, Usukati Huana, Notas Nino Manantio, King Nuta Yu Pantamino, and a male Nino Makwantan Kichia. Ka Nata Wananta. Ka nagutie kokuta ninoa, manatu, usukatie huana, womaneta teo, ka nosokomuso amoke, ninoho, kakanto chokes, piayo. I greet you in the words of peace in the Nipmung language, and I welcome you all here in this time of sharing, in this time of coming together, and I will offer a, a welcome song in our language.
Lynn, thank you so much, Larry, for that beautiful opening. Pagalagisi uvululuatak. Gunuksama, everyone, how you doing? All right, good. I'm so glad that you made it out. Um, good to see everybody in person. And after that storm, um, some of you are probably surprised to see so much snow up here right now, right? <laughs> So I said, welcome and good day in my traditional language. I'm Rhonda Anderson and back at the Baskin from Alaska. Um, before we get too into things, I really want to take a few minutes to recognize this land and give deep appreciation and gratitude for Mother Earth as a living being and acknowledgement um, that our collective Mother Earth provides everything that we need to survive. Tribes historically local to this area, um, as Stacy, thank you, Stacy, um, said before, um, Sokoki Abenaki, Pakumtuk, Nipmuc, Nanatuk, and Mohican tribes contemporarily situated are Nipmuc, Abenaki, and Mohican. I always like to begin by that folks, please get to know Indigenous peoples of your area. Ask what you can do to lift and raise their voices and honor their sovereignty. So in that spirit, I like to have three action items. The first one, and I'm going to keep saying this one. I'm going to keep saying this one until I see that we're having more changes locally. Recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative that glorifies colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples of this area. Be mindful that problematic terms like Pioneer Valley are a reminder of a legacy of dispossession, removal, and subsequent erasure. Second, please consider supporting the various indigenous artists that are here today. Um, Please look for our resources list that will be forthcoming after this event to inspire you to learn ways to reinforce, lift, and center Indigenous voices, narratives, literature, and public art. And lastly, of course, there are five bills in the State House still five bills that six tribes of Massachusetts support. So please visit maindigenousagenda.org to learn more information and uh, learn ways to, that you can support these efforts. So that means thank you for listening. That's the most important step. Officially, welcome to the eighth installment of the living presence of our history. Um, and today we'll be having a conversation with Indigenous authors regarding representation in literature. Um, I'm really honored to be with such an incredible panel today, um, many of whom I know personally and I adore, um, and some I'm entirely unabashedly a fangirl of. <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'm such a book nerd. If you've listened to any living presence, I say it every single time I'm a book nerd. If I find out that a panelist has written something, it becomes part of my collection. And the books that you see around the room, uh, most of them are, are mine. It's like 0.002% of my collection. <laughs> Um, I've also intentionally curated this panel uh, to represent regional um, authors and center youth and young adult education. Okay. Um, and we have now come to that very fun moment um, where I introduce our panelists. And I like to ask a rapid round quick question of each panelist so that you may get to know each panelist as an individual a little bit better. So I'm going to start with you, Chris. Okay. Chris is a longtime singer with the acclaimed uh, drum group Mystic River Singers based out of Connecticut. And you've traveled the US and Canada to many different events. Um, and you were also a senior advisor for the Emmy Award winning documentary Dawnland. Um, Chris was also a participant and co director of a short, absolutely gorgeous documentary, Wakuwapak. Wachkuwabak. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. The Approaching Dawn, uh, which was released in 2022, and it chronicled a historic collaboration in 2021 with Wabanaki musicians and storytellers and the 19-time Grammy-winning uh, cellist, Yo-Yo Ma. Um, Chris has published the uh, is a published author of the scholastic book, If You Live During the Plymouth Thanksgiving. And this nonfiction historical children's picture book earned star reviews from the um, school library journal, journal and Kirkus reviews. So I'm gonna go back a little bit into your, your bio, your introduction. Um, what was it like? to sing with Yo-Yo Ma as backup? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the question. Uh, you know, when it came to that particular project, um, I, I, in a way, backed into it. Uh, the, you know, um, uh, Yo-Yo Ma was coming to Acadia National Park, um, you know, does pop-up performances, as I'm sure if anybody follows his career, uh, you know, when people were getting vaccinated, he would show up and uh, play for the people getting vaccinated. Um, and he was coming to Okiti National Park as part of a journey uh, through his own life of trying to reconnect with nature because in his own life, he does not have that connection. He's performed in cities. Um, and this was kind of the first uh, of that. And, um, you know, so as he was planning this, his office reached out to me when I was working at the Abbey Museum as the executive director uh, with a question, you know, what could Yo-Yo Ma do uh, that would be meaningful to Wabanaki people? Because in this, you know, uh, journey to connect with nature and music and humanity, he did not want to leave Indigenous voices out. And uh, so my suggestion to uh, his crew was for Yo-Yo Ma to experience what it would feel like to uh, play his cello, uh, play his music for the sun on the coast as it rose, as we as Wabanaki people do um, as part of our cosmology as people of the dawn. And, um, you know, the answer came back um, that, uh, you know, instead he wanted to collaborate. Uh, and it kind of went from there. And Yo-Yo Ma, being who he was, uh, actually handed over uh, the power of the creation of this performance to us as Wabanaki performers. Um, so what was it like? Uh, let me just say that Yo-Yo Ma is a very down to earth person. Uh, if you meet him, he is just as genuine as, he's, as he is portrayed in the media, um, as, as real of a human being as you can get. Um, so uh, when it came to him working with indigenous folks, with Wabanaki people, he fit right in because he joked around with us and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, he became a friend of my father's during, uh, you know, the the experience during the rehearsal and, and other things. And so, and that relationship went on. And so it was really almost like meeting a, a relative from uh, a far away, you know, almost like somebody from a, a different tribe in a way, because he acted uh, as we would do, as as I do in this area, I'm Wabanaki. I'm not from this area. I'm a guest in this area, uh, you know, to the the tribes of this area. And and in uh, in that same way, Yo-Yo Ma uh, acted as a guest within Wabanaki homelands. And so it was magical in in a lot of ways. Uh, and and it's hard to describe in words. Thank you. That is a beautiful documentary. I wholeheartedly recommend that it gets seen. Um, on YouTube, by the way. Which Kuwabuk? Mm -hmm. Larry, um, you, uh, you've been introduced, so I won't go through that. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> um, Tales from a Whispering Basket was your first book. Yes. Um, what led you, and this is, these are loaded questions, but I, <laughs> about two, three minutes per question. Um, what led you to write this book of poetry and short stories? Thank you, Rhonda. Um, and thank you all. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I, um, I've been an artist my entire adult life, um, singing, storytelling, um, in uh, various forms of that uh, throughout U.S. and Canada um, with my family. And, um, and one of the things that inspired me about doing that, of traveling and sharing the culture and history and living presence of Nipmonk people was kind of undoing in my own way the trauma within myself, the trauma within my community. And I knew one of the best ways to do that is, is share the stories of our people to let the world know that we're still here. Um, and then it, it kind of dawned on me, another way to reach folks was to begin writing because I've always loved to write poetry as a youth. And so, uh, you know, I, I was um, suggested I should write a book. I said, okay, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and so uh, that, that began my journey. And it was a very long process. Those who 
who are writers know know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, with editing and all the different things and publications. And so I didn't, I had no idea what I was getting into. And I was really upset about that piece of it. I just wanted to tell my story and then all the, you know, the mechanics of in the publishing ugly world that is. <laughs> so, it, you know, and then, you know, you kind of grunt your teeth and like, okay, this comes with the deal. And so um, that began my journey. And, and, um, and the most important thing I wanted to share is like kind of shift the understanding about who we are as indigenous people. And uh, there, there are really some horrifying statistics when it comes to uh, early education, indigenous folks, and that, that kind of led me to write my ch children's book series I'm working on now. But a lot of the folks don't realize is that um, the most common experience of a Native American child in the US is from kindergarten to college, he will never see a teacher of his own racial group. He will never experience um, that kind of mirroring mirroring and, and kind of like a, a ownership of a, of a self actualization in a very, you know, significant way in terms of education and academics. But what they will see is mascots, uh, caricatures made out of their, their images and so on. And, and so um, I, I wanted to kind of uh, address that. And, and we also know from statistics that there are only about 1% of books that are geared towards early education for indigenous children, whereas there's over half for, for, for white children and about 25% of trucks and dinosaurs. Uh, and so the native folks are like 1%. And so I really wanted to, um, to kind, of, uh, uh, kind of work within my means and through my stories of kind of shifting that. And um, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do. So I'm really uh, just excited to be able to share that in, 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 through my own stories. And I usually use my kids, you know, my kids have my second book and now I'm using my other kid for this other book. So, you know, they're there. So I might as well, okay, you're, you're, I'll put you in the story. So, so uh, yeah, that's, that's been my uh, main focus of sharing and, and shifting this narrative. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Eric Gansworth uh, is a writer and visual artist enrolled in the Onondaga Nation, Eel Clan, born and raised at Tuscarora Nation. The author of 13 books has been widely published and has numerous solo and group exhibitions. Eric is a Lowry writer in residence at Canisius College and an NEH Distinguished Visiting Professor at Colgate University. His work received a Prince Honor uh, Award, which is the first Native author to receive this award in 2021. Eric was also long listed for the National Book Award and has received an American Indian Library Association Youth Literature Award, a Penn Oakland Award and an American Book Award. Eric's book, Apple Skin to the Core, was chosen for Time Magazine's 10 Best Young Adult and Children's Books for 2020. His newest book is My Good Man, which is a coming of age novel. Um, so I have a sentence, one sentence. Well, there's lots of things. I take books and I absolutely destroy them when I read them. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry that you have to see that. <laughs> um, but there was one sentence um, in, in the book, um, Apple Skin to the Core, that really spoke to me. And it was from uh, the, chapter, the chapter Masks Unmasked. Uh, page 121, and the sentence is, a pen, a brush, can be a dangerous weapon or shields for survival. I use them with care. Um, Eric, as an, as an artist and an author, um, can you expand in two minutes or less <laughs> on that statement? Well, I, I think that... Uh... Through your process uh, in any art form, um, the, the the final product is is as much what you've taken away as what you've left on the page, and uh, and so through the process of of working on a first draft, you know, I I kind of do it for me and what I think I want to say, and then when I'm getting further down the line, I imagine how it's going to affect others. Uh, and in this case, it was particularly tricky because this was a memoir. And it was really the first time I sort of warned my family ahead of time. I said, this is your one and only shot. I'm writing a memoir. If you don't want to be in it, let me know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for the most part, I knew how people were going to respond. Um, but I felt a tremendous responsibility. And, and I think that's 
that's kind of what masks do, you know, is they, um, uh, they allow us to see something and they, they allow us to, um, to keep something private as well. And I think that's what, that's what an artist does. So um, that's, I guess, how, how a brush or a pen um, can do both of those things simultaneously. And largely how I choose to uh, keep them as a foundation of my work as an artist. Thank you so much for sharing. Morgan Talty, a citizen of the Penobscot Indian Nation. Morgan is the author of the nationally best-selling and critically acclaimed story, a, a, a story collection, I should say, uh, Night of the Living Res from Tin House Books, which has won the New England Book Award and was a finalist for the Barnes and Noble Discover Great New Writers. Uh, was the 2023 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, the Story Prize, and the Penn W. Robert Bingham Prize for Debut Short Story Collection. Um, Talty is an assistant professor of English in creative writing and Native American and contemporary literature at the University of Maine in Orono. And he is on the faculty at the Stone Coast MFA, the Institute of American Indian Arts, and a prose editor for the Massachusetts Review. So wow, with a <laughs> with a, a bio like that, Morgan, I was really shocked to read somewhere that you never considered yourself a writer and that you didn't really read books in your younger years. Is this true? It is. Yeah, I did not like books. Um, I don't know if I didn't like them. I feel like I just grew up in an environment that made it difficult to kind of like, I don't know, um, experience education in that sort of like Western way. But I always loved storytelling. Like that was the thing I always loved. And, you know, I, I didn't start really reading and writing until I was about 18 um, when I was like, oh, wow, I can tell stories in this in this way. Um, but yeah, I was not a fan of, of books um, at, <laughs> at all, except for Harry Potter. I will say I read the Harry Potter series only after I'd seen the movie and I knew what people looked like. So <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. Um, Yvonne Tiger, I love you, Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> Yvonne Tiger is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and, a, and of Seminole and Muscogee descent. She is a PhD candidate in the Cultural, Social, and Political Thought Program at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, Yvonne holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Smith College and two Master of Arts from the University of Oklahoma. She is an Indigenous art historian and teaches Indigenous Studies courses at the University of Lethbridge and Master of Fine Arts Studio Arts at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Uh, she was a scholar in residence at Smith College in 2021 and um, a 21-22 and 22-23 Cobell Scholar. Yvonne, I met you when you were a student um, at Smith. <laughs> My gosh, how many, 20, 21, 22 years ago? Are we dating ourselves? No, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you really encouraged me at the time to go to the five colleges and spend time with native students. And you really imparted that they must be feeling lonely or homesick for other native folks. Um, and I also remember that really ties into the story of how you found the work of a native student who was at Smith almost a hundred years earlier. That was Angel Decora, and how that made you feel. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk briefly, um, again, this is like the rapid fire question time. Can you talk briefly about that time and how it shaped your future? Yeah, absolutely. And Chris, I was running around with Chris Pegram too. So <laughs> with Mystic River. <laughs> so I was probably met. Um, so yeah, it was, um, it was, uh, it was, um, I don't, I can't, I grew up, I was born and raised in Germany. So I was very diasporic in my, my own existence. And so 
I had already been at Smith a year before I found out that Angel had been there. And I was really angry that I hadn't known because I had been the president of the Native American Women of Smith at that point um, for a year. This is my second term. And it, um, it changed everything. It changed uh, the focus of what I was working on um, going forward. It changed my perspective on the complexity of the lives of indigenous women especially in, in the sort of situation that she was in as a Winnebago woman or girl who was taken from her home, taken to Hampton, um, had all kinds of other things happen, end up at Smith and then go back to Carlisle. The complexity in trying to understand that kind of a lived life and also make sense of my own life um, it really did. It really altered everything and my perspective and the questions that I ask and that I continue to ask of my work. And right now, as I teach Indigenous women at the university that I'm at now, um, you know, I always encourage my students to look at the complexity and also to be very careful of the, this president's stance of, you know, because it can be really hard to understand the decisions that people made back then when we think about the lives that we live now. But um, yeah, I hope that answered that. No, oh, beautiful. Thank you, Yvonne. And I love you too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Debbie Reese um, is tribally enrolled at Nambe Oenge, a sovereign native nation located in the Southwest. Dr. Reese's book chapters, articles, and blog, American Indians in Children's Literature, are used by educators across the United States and Canada. Debbie, your story about how and why you started doing the work um, at AICL um, is really sort of essential for framing the topics of today's conversation. Um, can you please share with us um, Tell us the story of how you began sharing this critical analysis of Indigenous peoples in children's literature. All right. Good morning. Thank you all for having me and thank you for being part of this conversation. I left the reservation in 1994 to go study family literacy at the University of Illinois. Got there and there was a mascot. And I, I'm so committed to storytelling and what we learn from storytelling. And, and as I spent time there, I began to be invited to come to various civic groups and dance. And I'd say, I don't dance for civic groups. I, for us, dance is prayer. It happens at a certain time, a certain place. And no, I can't do that. Well, can you come and tell us a story? They would reply. And I would say, no, I'm not a storyteller, but I am a teacher. I'd be glad to come and spend time with you and share what I know about this or that topic. Um, and they didn't want that. They wanted a performer. They wanted a dancer. They wanted a storyteller. So I, there at the University of Illinois, which is a research one university, um, I saw a tremendous amount of ignorance and started thinking, okay, still st still staying in that area of literacy, what are children's books telling them about who we are? And it was easy to see once I started looking very critically at them, like Clifford the Big Red Dog wanting to be um, an Indian at Halloween and Grizzly Bob leading a campfire story with his hands up in the air. And it went on and on as I started looking at that and seeing just how prevalent in children's books, mascotry, kinds of images are there. Um, that's uh, when I started to think, okay, what can I do with my interest in children's books that will help people understand who we really are? Um, and that was a two, that's there, there at least two focuses that I, or foci, I don't know the right word, and I don't care. I don't know that right English word for that. Um, my goals are twofold. One is to bring forward Native writers because they bring insight, knowledge, and life experience to their storytelling that a white writer can only imagine. And generally, they imagine it very badly. And the second um, is to call attention to the problems in those white authored books. Island of the Blue Dolphins, No Way. Little House on the Prairie, 
Absolutely not. And these are books that people who are teaching kids hold so dear because somebody read it to them, somebody assigned it to them, and they have this nostalgic feeling for it. Um, what it does, unfortunately, is it creates a condition such that any of the writers here today, when they come forward with their books, kids don't know that those are actually books by Native people or that the people in them are actually Native people because they're looking for the stereotype. So the twofold work is really important. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Larry, I know that you, you started to talk about this, um, your similar experience of not being seen in literature as a child and having that missed opportunity to have a mirror held up. And you, you touched so briefly on uh, your next project, which is a children's book about Kateo. Yes. Can you please talk about that and why that is an important part of the work that you're doing right now? Um, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I just want to go back to something Morgan said too that really um, resonated when he talked about um, not reading as a youngster. I was the same way. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's something that um, uh, folks need to take a lot of consideration to in terms of Indigenous people. We're, we're all the survivors of the you know, we're in this post post apocalyptic fog of of survival from the boarding schools and res residential schools and so on. So like um, I'm first generation college. And in many of if you look at my entire network of my mom's family and uncles, I'm, in many cases, we're first generation high school. Uh, right from my mother's generation, they were all farmers and lived in the woods and they were not encouraged to go to school. They were encouraged to stay on the farm and, and do their thing. And they were kind of kept away from uh, white people. So th that was kind of the life. And so when Morgan talked about uh, environments where education wasn't kind of like uh, pushed in that sense, and it was um, it was kind of the norm, right? You know, coming from those generations. Um, and so having that, I, I went through the similar process of not really getting into books. I had a very short attention span. And, um, and I'm really glad this came up because this is something I wanted to talk about to kind of hit out there to other uh, young Native writers who are coming up who maybe have, have experienced this. So uh, I did love to learn always, but you know, the, so I had to get through that book, right? Uh, and so um, uh, having a short attention span, you know, I'd have to read a page three, four, five, six times. And it's really about just taking that dedication to, to push yourself and do that. And so, and then it, it's, it's like, a, it's a learned practice, right? Reading like anything else. And so that kind of um, excel that process. And so, and so another thing I want to touch, touch on when I was talking earlier about numbers um, is that, which inspired me to continue on this writing path of, of teaching about who we are as a people is that 50% um, of the cultural and linguistic diversity in the United States is of indigenous people. But we don't realize that. In Rhonda's communities alone, how many languages are there? There's hundreds. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and there's tribes I don't even are aware of across the country. So. And then we think about uh, some of the books uh, uh, Debbie pointed out. I mean, they're they're ridiculous and absurd because they're not even getting to the real people. And so um, uh, uh, I have the books I have presently are for young adult and adult. And so this really pushed me to to go further. And I have some work with the Massachusetts uh, Department of Public Health where we create a, a life skills series called um, um, Circle Tides of Mother Earth, where we really wanted to address the crisis of opioid addiction and and suicide in our communities where. Massachusetts alone between 2014 and 2016, we were we lost uh, 24 youth to overdose and suicide. So we were losing a child a month for two years. And um, that led to the, the culmination of the, the, the book there, Coming Home and uh, Circle Tied to Mother Earth, where it's beyond uh, a curriculum, it's storytelling, it's traditional knowledge shared back to our youth to help them uh, navigate through this life uh, uh, in terms of not just saying no to drugs, but also helping them make healthy choices around diet, around well-being, around their spirituality, and so on. And so, and then I got tapped by the um, University of Iowa and uh, Native uh, Health Network to create this literature, because if anybody knows the Native Health Network, they, they do a lot of work around the well-being of Indigenous people across the country. And so they wanted to um, create this series of, of children's books, and they wanted me to, to lead that. So I gathered up some folks from the area, some Wabanaki and some uh, Wampanoag folks to, so I created this team of people and I'm not an artist. So I got a, a, a Wampanoag relative who's an artist. And so he drew these just beautiful, brilliant images. Um, and so I said, okay, we need, we need a person. So I thought of my little son 
uh, Kateo. And so um, and then I started thinking about the process of the book. It would be the adventures of Kateo and its early education. We're talking um, from ages three to five. And, and so, and so, um, and what we really wanted to do here is show indigenous people by indigenous people and create these life stories, right? So, you know, for early education, you, you give them a problem. Uh, there's a problem in the story and he has to overcome it. And then there's little situations of how he does these figuring out. Um, and, and, uh, and it's also codified through a native lens. So he's going through life and, you know, in this contemporary way of, you know, he may come across this problem. And how does Kateo solve this problem? And how does he deal with certain situations in life? And it's a really teaching about sharing and all the different principles that we hold as indigenous people, right? So sharing, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, dealing with uh, uh, negotiation, you know, kind of like uh, uh, around sharing and justice and, and, and sustainability and understanding each other, you know, communication skills, all the different things that uh, are not readily shared in some of the <laughs> curriculum that we need. So um, it's been a work in process. And um, the title of the book is The Adventures of Kateo. Uh, be and because it's not out yet, I'm not going to tell too much. I'm going to be an Arthur, <laughs> be an Arthur for a minute. <laughs> and so, uh, but I'm really excited about the work. He has these cute little sayings in the book. Um, and so, uh, so that's kind of um, where I'm going with that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. And what a gift, you know, um, for your child, who's absolutely adorable, by the way, <laughs> to be able to see himself mirrored. Yes. You know, that was that was um, a struggle growing up. And my mom is in the front row of uh, she tried very hard to make sure that I was mirrored in, in society, which you worked very hard at that. Um, and again, you know, I want to put it out there that most books about Native people, especially historical fiction, are written by non-Native authors to the tune of 78% or more. Yeah. So understanding that there's very little representation in historical Native American literature um, that Native authors actually write. Chris, you wrote, of course, we talked about this, the educational book for Scholastic, um, If You Live During Plymouth Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Um, and I absolutely love the way you have written the book. Um, there is explicit language on settler uh, colonialism and the myths surrounding the holiday. Um, can you please discuss the importance of using that critical indigenous lens in your educational book and why, why you wrote it? Um, yeah, so when it came for me, where, where does that lens come from? You know, like uh, a lot of the authors uh, that have spoken, th there wasn't a lot of example, uh, you know, and presence in, in media for me uh, growing up. But uh, I was blessed to grow up uh, the son of Wayne Newell, um, you know, who spent 50 years plus uh, working to preserve our language or music um, and wrote over 40 children's books all in the Passamaquoddy language. Um, you know, so when it comes to, uh, you know, my uh, experience with Indigenous literature, that was my first experience with Indigenous literature is learning these books uh, in school, uh, in, in uh, my community, in my Dokmi book. Um, but then, you know, you, you go out into the world, I get out to Dartmouth College, and I see how ignorant, uh, you know, the uh, American public is about Native people. And in fact, back in the 90s, if I were to tell somebody I was past Macquarie, a student, um, their reference was the old Pete's Dragon movie from the 70s, you know, where the town uh, is named past Macquarie, and that's all they had. Um, you know, so for me, uh, it, it was very frustrating to have to constantly educate everybody uh, about, you know, who I was. But, um, you know, and this is something that, you know, I, I had, had a chip on my shoulder, actually, for, for quite a lot of my life uh, before becoming a professional educator. And when I went into that world, I, I uh, entered in back into it at the Pequot Museum. Uh, if any of you have never been there before, the Pequot Museum is the largest tribal museum uh, in this in the world, uh, and it tells a history of Connecticut unapologetically from the perspective of the Pequots, which includes the good, the bad, and the ugly of colonization. Um, and uh, what I saw in my time there, I became the education supervisor, ran public programs, is that children from Connecticut would enter the space with simple, with actually innocent questions: Are Pequots still alive? Right, that that's what they've been fed the implicit biases of of the children's literature that they're running into. Now all natives are dead and gone. By the time they leave, right, they have learned once again all the good, the bad, and the ugly of the story of how the living community got to be where it is today. 
but they are leaving with the knowledge that Pequots are part of the fabric of what became the state of Connecticut. And they are actually more excited when they leave that space as a result. So when this particular project came along, I'm an educator by trade. I am not a writer by trade, um, but I had been at the Pequot Museum because there's sometimes a conflation between the, the Mayflower landing and uh, the day of Thanksgiving declared after the Pequot massacre. And as a result, I created an educational program called Demystifying Thanksgiving. And uh, as a, you know, to, uh, uh, to teach about uh, the history of the Thanksgiving holiday and actually how we got to the creation of it in the 19th century. Um, and that's where the material really came from, um, was just my, my uh, want to answer these simple questions for these children and their parents, by the way, uh, you know, uh, in a way that they would go home with something, you know, even more full, uh, you know, even though it does not always, uh, you know, read as pleasant, you know, when it comes to the story of colonization, that does not mean that we should lie to our children, because the, the effect of that is those children grow up. They mean a native person. They're going to meet my children, right? When they go to college and they get to diverse environments, and they're going to have a really awkward experience as a result. And that doesn't help those students either. So it's not just representation, you know, and, and my children seeing ourselves in books, but also, um, you know, uh, tackling that ignorance, which does not benefit anybody in this country. Thank you so much. Like that was, you dropped a truth bomb right there. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I said, I really appreciate the truth that's being told in your story. Um, and, and I think that that benefits, uh, non-native students, uh, greatly. Um, and, and I see this, uh, quite often as I work with mascots, mm -hmm. you know, is that if we had that educational piece in place, mm -hmm. then the answer about mascotry would become obvious. Um, Eric. You have also uh, seen the importance or the need of educating young adult readers about your contemporary culture, as you have published uh, the Scholastic book, If I Ever Get Out of Here. Um, Eric, in, in the book, you immediately get into the tough subjects that are glaringly absent from the curriculum in the United States. And uh, the first chapters really tackle, I mean, the first, literally the first chapter and a little into the second, tackle the tough topics of boarding schools, racism, stereotypes, poverty, alcoholism, and intergenerational traumas. You are genuinely educating young adults on the complexities of being indigenous. Um, can you please maybe expand on the significance of that type of education in your book? Um, I, I think one of the, uh, that was really my first book for young readers. And so I was kind of doing a learning curve there as well. <laughs> Um, and kind of thinking about what what sorts of materials are going into there, but but mostly I was um, I was just really working on a novel that reflected my avoidance of middle school. Um, as a fiction writer, it's one of the things you do is you, know, you consider like where where your character is going to have conflict, and because that's really what drives fiction. And I realized that I had been writing for a fair amount of time at that point. I think you know I've had nine books on. And I realized that none of my characters ever went through middle school. They went through like elementary school and then they just kind of vanished for a while and reemerged in high school. And I thought, well, what was that all about? You know, what am I avoiding as a, as a person there? And, um, and I thought, okay, probably this is, this is the place to begin. This is the place to find conflict for, for a young reader and with a, with a young protagonist. And, uh, and I realized that that was, that was a huge turning point in my young life because I am from a very, very small uh, res in, in Western New York. You know, it's home to, depending on who you ask, uh, about a thousand people. Some people say it's around 800, some people say it's around 1200, so I'll say a thousand to be safe. Um, and that's really, uh, that's the only demographic I ever spent any time with, uh, was just people from, from home. I um, mean, we, you know, we obviously left the res to go to stores and things. And my, my mom was a house cleaner uh, for a living. So she, you know, quite intimately uh, had been in white people's homes. And occasionally I had been in their 
um, with her because uh, she would just bring me to work if she you know had no other option. And I saw that other life, and uh, and I thought, um, you know, I didn't quite grasp like the that parallel world was existing beyond ours uh, until I hit middle school and I discovered um, that you know it was just just tremendous uh, awakening and and back then we were um, academically tracked and uh, and I, I guess probably I I tended to uh, test well so I was tracked kind of in the achiever section uh, but I was like the only one uh, from the res who did and so I noticed immediately everybody else in the class knew other people and I was the only one kind of going solo and very quickly realized that all my frame of references um, were not shared by anyone and so I had to start figuring out you know um, why that was happening and, and ultimately I you know quickly came to the conclusion that uh, I was living an alternate history <laughs> And, uh, and the, the novel kind of unfolds from there. And that, um, and it turned out to be even more true. I guess that was the, the weird and most shocking thing was when this book came out, I discovered that it was labeled as historical fiction. So I felt definitely like a geezer at that point uh, because it's set more or less when I was a kid. So uh, I, had, I had become historical fiction. Um, and, and so I thought, well, it was important that if I was going to write intimately about a character, a protagonist who was indigenous, then that person should have the same frame of references I had. And, and as a result, I think, you know, it kind of becomes educational, but maybe more incidentally um, because of the life lived. Thank you. Um, that is so true. Uh, I appreciate that. I also wanted to point out that there's a beautiful connection with our panelists and that book as Debbie Reese encouraged um, Eric Gransworth to submit a piece that eventually became If I Ever Got Out of Here to Scholastic. Is that true? Yes. Um, <laughs> Debbie was, uh, uh, we met uh, being uh, kind of co-keynoting at a couple of different conferences in very rapid succession. And, and I, I did tend to write about young life uh, a fair amount, but mostly from an adult's point of view reflecting. And so Debbie kept saying, so when are you going to start writing for kids? And I was like, uh, never. And, uh, and she said, I bet I'm going to find a situation where that's not going to be true anymore. And I said, okay, well, good luck there. And, uh, and then she did, so she sort of found the, the offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, so, yeah, that, that interaction became the, I guess, the beginning of my writing for young people, and that's largely what I've done since. Thank you, Debbie. So don't, don't mess with her. <laughs> Um, so now I want to like take a turn here and I really want to dive deeper into representation and stereotype busting with uh, literature. So Morgan, um, you write about the intergenerational and historical trauma in your communities and you speak to uh, the contemporariness of the trauma unfolding in your book of short stories. The Night of the Living Res. And through those short stories, uh, you show maybe this is this is my interpretation, the why and how self-destruction happens. And and I was kind of really shocked to find your book's connecting point. Um, and I had this this aha moment of understanding uh, the trauma the main character moves through and what made him the way he is. Um, so what are your I guess, I don't know, what are your inspirations for the book and the importance of that contemporary representation? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, I am, you know, I've, I've always liked this quote by uh, Louise Owens, who's a, who was a fiction writer and, and a scholar. Um, you know, he said, you know, non-native readers, come to indigenous fiction, um, basically uh, hoping to get a comfortable, you know, colorful, easy tour of Indian country. And 
you know, I think we've been, all of us have been sort of, you know, talking about that in a way and that, you know, there's so many books out there that um, engage with that, that idea, um, which I think has a lot to do with capitalism and, and what sells and, and that sort of thing. Um, but with, with Night of the Living Res, you know, I was really, really deeply interested in telling stories about people and their emotions. Um, you know, I was, I was really, you know, for me, fiction is about feeling. It's about, you know, we, you know, I think it was the, the poet Ocean Vyong in, in a New Yorker interview who recently, I don't know if it was recent, but, you know, he's like, he's like, I feel more alive when I read fiction. And I feel like fiction, I feel like storytelling helps us sort of gives us a little shock, a little jolt in what it means to be human. And, you know, so that's, that's where I've always come from as a writer is like, I'm going to build a story around, um, you know, this sense of feeling um, or these types of feelings and putting those as the foundation and then building upon it, you know, culture and, you know, history and all of those things. And because I feel like if we do it the other way around, we might fall into the trap of, you know, positioning the work as performative in, in a way. And so with my stories, I'm, I'm always like, you know, and, and it's not an easy thing to do because, you know, we read, or, or let me say it this way, is I feel like, I, I'm trying to articulate this in the best way possible, but it's like, like fiction and nonfiction and, and all of these modes of storytelling that we see in, in Western culture, like are not, they're not a form of storytelling that we traditionally used, you know what I mean? And so it's like readers from a Western perspective for thousands and thousands of years have read works and have looked at works in this specific way. And so it's like, we can think of telling traditional stories and trying to put them in, you know, fiction. And it's like, we get readers who are like, oh, well, that wasn't really a story. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it's not fitting with the mold of what they expect a book to be. And so I feel like with my book, it was like, I want to, I wanted to write a book that was fighting against that. And, you know, I, I can't take, you know, I, you know, if my book did that, it did that, but it's like, I feel like there were so many other contemporary writers at the time who kind of just sort of like blasted open the door, you know, like Tommy Orange with There There and, you know, Therese Mayute and, um, you know, Brandon Hobson also who came, who was, who had been writing, but, you know, like after the door had opened, all these writers came out and um, yeah. So for, for me, you know, it was, it was always about, um, you know, avoid, not avoiding stereotypes, but starting with emotion and building upon it and then being like, this is who these people are, right? Like this is a sliver of a sliver of who these people are. Thank you. The, the short stories were, um, in my opinion, very complex. And um, I honestly didn't realize uh, that it that they were connected to each other at first because the, the stories were so different. Um, little snippets of a lifetime. And um, anyway, so I'm going to leave it at that. I don't want to spoil the book for anybody. Um, Eric, um, in Apple Skin to the Core, and, and I think just in general, your writing, um, you combine this rare gift of art prose and storytelling uh, to name what community life and indigenous cultures are and how they move alongside colonization. Um, and this, this method is sort of, I don't know, I, I would consider it kind of all encompassing and, and uses pop culture to add to a new level maybe of contemporariness or to reclaim or an, an indigenize mainstream society, indigenizing mainstream society. Um, so I would like to read um, another fragment of a piece from Apple Skin to the Core. It's a part of a poem um, that is called Migration. And it's the very first 
part of um, the poem, uh, page 172. Eventually, you will become what's called an Indian writer. But weirdly, when you make this assertion, an unlikely percentage of people hear you say Native American storyteller. <laughs> Instead, they expect you to reveal life lessons for children disguised as stories about anthropomorphic animals. So here is a story about siblings and reservations and the culture of returns. But just in case you can't hear me, let me tell you a little something about robins and their young. Um, that really, that really popped out for me. Um, as a literary author, Eric, do you feel you're constantly up against these stereotypes and have a need to break down these misinformed expectations? And maybe how do you do that by using pop culture? Um, yeah, well, it, it, uh, it used to happen all the time. Uh, and for, you know, as I said, the first uh, at least 15 years of my of my career, I wrote for adults. And I mean, like adult adults, not pornos, obviously, but also, uh, you know, kind of on the gritty side. And uh, various colleges and universities would invite me you know, to speak. And, uh, and no matter what they put on the posters, uh, and fairly often, it just said, you know, poet, fiction writer, um, all kinds of people brought like these little kids. Uh, because well, all they saw was Native American. So they were like waiting for me, I guess, as Debbie experienced as well. They were waiting for me to dance or waiting for me to tell some kind of story. And uh, and I did, but never really quite the stories that they were thinking of. And uh, and so I thought, well, you know, one way to to check people's expectations without them getting super defensive um, is is with humor. And, and I am also just kind of naturally a smart ass. I don't really know how to not be a smart ass. And, and I just accept that that's, that's the way I deliver. Um, and, uh, and, and at this point, mostly, I don't care. You know, if you didn't do your research well and you show up with a nine-year-old um, and I'm reading something for a 15-year-old, that's on you, that's not on me. Uh, but the reality is also, if you've given this kid a phone at this point, um, you know, there's like way more that they're being exposed to in the culture beyond me being smart ass. So, uh, I figure it's all kind of, um, you know, open for discussion at that point. And, uh, and I, and it's not my job to tailor my presentation to your lack of awareness. Um, and so for me, I decided to write about the, the res as I knew it, and as I live it, and you know, as my family lives it. And, uh, and our world is fairly saturated with popular culture. And, uh, you know, and I think even there, uh, we're often kind of judged by others for our poor choices because, you know, uh, like my mom, she gave us really unusual choices, you know, like we didn't have a lot of money, but we didn't have running water. So that should tell you how little bit of money we had. And so she would have saved a little bit um, at, the, at the end of summer. And she'd say, so um, you can have uh, a new pair of jeans or you can have a couple of albums. And I always went for the album because I could go to Goodwill or Salvation Army and get some jeans. And, uh, and so I had a really good music collection and uh, people would be like, how is it that you have, you know, a record player and you don't have plumbing? And I'm like, I don't know, you've done the cost analysis of plumbing and you've done the cost analysis of a record player. They're not quite the same thing. And, but it was also this weird judgy um, sentiment that we should be denied all pleasures we might want just because we were poor. And, uh, you know, I just kind of, rather than flipping the bird, because that's kind of counterproductive, um, I thought transforming American pop culture and allowing it to be seen through an indigenous lens was maybe a, a more productive way of opening their eyes and their ears. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I know in Apple to Apple, you used Beatles. 
um, as part of your music, um, your music selection to, I don't know, um, indigenize pop culture. And then um, in your latest book, you used, where is the latest book? Oh, my good man. Am I, am I correct when I'm reading this that you used Rush? Yeah, Rush is your... the big prize. <laughs> Right? Sure. We got clapping out here. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, so I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and and really sort of taking back, um, you're, you're like indigenizing. It's like reverse colonization. <laughs> so I think that's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I think we, we probably grew up in about the same time frame. So for me, the books are, are really uh, relevant. Um, so very exciting. <laughs> um, uh, and so just to recap, right? So we've talked about historical representation through an indigenous lens, and we've talked about contemporary expression. And what really piques my interest um, is visualizing possible future selves. Where is that, right? Um, so Yvonne, you wrote a very compelling article on indigenizing the final frontier, the art of indigenous storytelling through graphic novels. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt of your article. Um, and you were, it was your interpretation of a story in one of the, the Moonshot uh, graphic novel volumes. I have all three volumes here because I'm such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, let's see, where is it? Quote, fortunately, indigenous artists have sought inclusion in the science fiction graphic novel genre to retell their traditional stories and reinvigorate them with futures intended by their ancestors in settings undoubtedly beyond their wildest imaginings. Since the final frontier is part of Western settler ideology, Indigenous peoples do not see the galaxy or celestial bodies as a frontier at all. No, Indigenous peoples, including their ancestors, see that space as part of their enduring cultural territory and a place to share with all of their relatives." End quote. Um, wow, I think like for me, that just blew my mind. Um, and it's so important to imagine uh, ourselves in, in, in the future. Um, can you please expand to our audience what your article is about and the importance of the Moonshot series for young readers? Yeah, absolutely. What is my article about? There, there. <laughs> There was a moment um, when a colleague of mine said, um, there is so much science fiction, because I'm an indigenous art historian. And so there's a lot of um, science fiction, sci-fi, speculative fiction influence coming into indigenous art in this moment. And so let's get some people together and write about this, because we don't we see it, but we don't really articulate what this means in terms of our cosmologies and, um, you know, just other ways of knowing and worldviews. And so it felt important. And one of the most, one of the pieces of pop culture that, um, that I think resonates with a certain generation, and then it's continued to go on is Star Wars. And so there had to be a place where I started and it was in that final frontier, right? That um, they talk about. And, you know, I don't believe that, you know, speaking very broadly about indigenous people that our people saw the final frontier as final or finite. And so, you know, we attribute so much to, to our place-based knowledge and ways of knowing and being um, 
part of that includes the cosmos. And I know that from my mound building ancestors. And so, you know, these times, these celestial happenings, the solstice, the equinox, all of these things mattered. And so to be able to talk about them in reference to some of the art production that was happening felt important. But for me, it, it was really through those graphic novels and Moonshot, um, because then that was really one of the only things that was out there. There were a few books floating around, but those few first Moonshots brought together indigenous words and not all indigenous art, but some. As the Moonshot series got went further along into the third series, you'll see all the stories are written about the whole production, the art, the graphic, the graphic work is um, done by indigenous artists. And so these things, this, this whole, the, the continuity and the drive to be very, in, to indigenize Moonshot as well as to continue to indigenize sci-fi um, and speculative fiction, it's really been important. For me, one of the most important things about it was that some of those stories tell the traditional or customary tales um, or a tradition from some other nations, right? And so that to me enabled those stories to reach different generations. And for me, it was important, as I said, having grown up um, a diasporic Jalagi woman, um, that um, it reached, it's able to reach people who are not able to be home to have the traditional storytellers reach them, but in a way that reaches them as young people now. And so that, um, that drive to reach a contemporary young indigenous person felt really important to me. It felt important that it reaches kids on reses as well as urban indigenous kids and um, people who are, cannot be within their home territories to, to learn. And I think that was the beauty of it. But also along with the fact that it continues to build upon the idea that our past is really so imbued in our future. Because what they're doing, we're taking these ancient stories and moving them forward um, into galaxies like thousands and thousands of years in the future and we're still using our traditional knowledge to for us to survive i mean that really speaks to the level of um you know technical knowledge that we that our ancestors had that is still relevant today and um and so yeah i i fell in love with those stories they're um you know they're very deeply embedded in, in my memory in terms of um, you know, the things that they do and did and can contribute to uh, young people's knowledge and hopefully inspire people to continue to write. Absolutely, and it makes it easier for children to, to read graphic novels. It's very intriguing and it's very, um, again, a very important mirror to visualize um, a possible future self in the very distant future, uh, and and how you you framed that right. There's another quote in in your your article. The retelling of this story helped demonstrate to me, as a Native American woman, that we, as Indigenous peoples, have culturally relevant future to imagine, to work towards. After all, our oral histories and traditional stories teach us less, lessons that often save us from ourselves, thus proving to me that our ancestors were truly concerned about our future. Um, and, and that really, um, I'm such a book nerd. <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is a, a collection of uh, short, um, science, 10 science fiction stories to rewire your perceptions called Tasting Light. And it's, it's a, a wide variety of, of authors. Uh, but one of them um, is a woman I know from Anaktuvik Pass, Rainey Hobson. And her piece is called The Weight of a Name. And it really is an incredible story about how the Anupiat thousands of years from now um, are 
sort of this uh this this hinge moment where we could recolonize a planet that is too cold and that our ancestral knowledge and animals and knowledge of the animals is is going to be what saves humanity right <laughs> like that really like it gives me chills to think about think about it um and as well you know uh growing up with my daughter my daughter growing up she uh really took to graphic novels and not so much I would read to her uh, since she was two days old I read to her every night um, but graphic novels is what she took to and um, a girl called Echo was another mm -hmm. uh, great series uh, the Dear Woman Anthology is a fabulous series um, as well uh, let's see there's one that I couldn't find she was sleeping in her room this morning and you know I couldn't go in and, and raid her room <laughs> but uh, super Indian Super Indian by Aragon Starr, um, who's Kickapoo. She was the first um, Native American woman to to do um, a comic that was written and illustrated by by a Native woman. Um, so, so I just wanted to, you know, bring those up. To, I'm I'm going to now. Um, I'm going to share about my daughter's experience. Um, in in elementary school and and i've talked about this this before um oh, i've talked about this i've talked about this a couple of times before and it's it's about how education uh, really begins early in the disappearance and erasure um, mm -hmm. of indigenous peoples and it begins early in elementary schools um and in my daughter's school uh in 2012 so this isn't you know far back history, but 2012, um, she came home with some vocabulary words and it was heathen, squaw, savage, moccasin. Yeah. Um, and it turns out when I questioned the teacher, why my daughter was learning uh, a racial slur that they, they were introducing to the class nonfiction books which third grade nonfiction is very subjective, especially when you're learning about it for the first time. Um, and the book where most of these slurs came from was The Courage of Sarah Noble. Uh, the children in her classroom read that Indians eat human meat off the bone. They would just as soon skin you alive. And uh, the author likened the Indians which were likely Narragansett folks, um, as little brown mice. Um, of course, the vocabulary test came home with the sentence, Indians are savages. Yeah. Um, and when I asked my daughter about it, she said, I, I was confused on how to use savage in a sentence. And so I asked my teacher and she said, just write Indians are savages. Um, she didn't capitalize Indians because we are a proper noun. And, uh, and uh, so she had to erase it and do, capitalize Indians. And um, it was marked very well done. Um, the unintended consequences of that were really noticeable um, when my daughter's friends came to dinner. And the year before they learned how to say good morning in their classroom in her language in our language and now they said she's not native because she's not a savage and she doesn't eat human meat um, so i had to show pictures of our family members and really kind of walk back that teaching that came home to my house and my family and that was devastating and the long-term effects in her friend connections were absolutely devastating and the long-lasting effects of losing trust of your teachers i think was absolutely heartbreaking and i don't think she ever got over that um the alternate books for the students at that time in the classroom were equally problematic it was farmer boy by laura ingalls wilder and the education of little tree which was um the, which was penned by Asa Carter um, under the pseudonym of Forrest Carter, and he was a known segregationist and um, hate speech writer. 
Um, so I talked to the principal and the teachers and I offered solutions, you know, really making sure that you're talking to me about anything indigenous before it gets taught in the classroom, because when it comes home, that's a problem. Um, and fortunately I was able to recommend other books and have some native folks come in and do some reteaching, uh, rewiring as it was. Um, but the American Indians in children's literature site, um, was absolutely a gift. Um, and so Debbie Reese, if I could turn to you, um, and take all the time you need to, um, talk about how to identify a book and use your incredible, uh, website, please. Okay, well, I'm probably going to repeat some of what I said earlier. What I recommend is that people look for children's books by Native writers. Um, so that's the first thing that I, that I look for. And again, it is because I think that Native writers can bring knowledge and life experience to the subject that they're writing about that a white writer cannot. I also think that Native writers should try to stick to their own nations because when they're talking about spiritual aspects of a children's book or spiritual um, aspects of a nation that's not their own, they don't know what's okay to share and what's not okay to share because we all have ways that we protect our own nation's stories. Um, the, that metaphor that you have been talking about, a mirror, the books are mirrors, that came from a, from a, a literacy professor at the Ohio State University named Rudine Sims Bishop. And her idea was that books can be mirrors if they reflect who you are. They can be windows if they give you um, a look into someone else's culture. I added curtains to that metaphor because as Native writers, we draw the curtain on certain things. As Native people, we close the door, we close the window because of a long history of exploitation and misrepresentation of what we do in our homes. Uh, so um, anyway, so that con that idea of mirror, um, books as mirrors has many dimensions to it and people it's taken off in the last few years. And I'm glad people are using it, but they really should be aware of where it came from. Um, this is the intellectual work of a woman of color. And too often the ideas that Native and people of color bring forth get appropriated and taken by mainstream white scholars and they go on the circuit and make a lot of money and people who originated those concepts don't get those opportunities. So being mindful of your own citations, the, what you're talking about, being careful to credit where things came from, I think is really important. Um, I had some notes here that you you referenced some data. One of you referenced some data about how many books came out in a year, and you the thing that you were talking about was a graphic um, uh, representation of the publication of children's books in the year 2018. Um, that was put out by the the data is put out by the Cooperative Center for Children's Books at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So it's a place where people have been counting books for a long for over 20 years, and representation of peoples of color and Native peoples in those books for all that time. What's important though that people don't really take time to to understand I think is that they can look at the graphic and they can see that the you know the native child has a small mirror because we have smaller mirrors there's just not that many books but at the children's feet there are shards of glass that 2018 graphic says that 23 books out of over 3,000 that came out that year are that have enough native content to be called a native book However, half of them are by white writers that are misrepresentations and stereotypes. So at the feet of the children in that graphic, you'll see broken glass because our children's representational um, opportunities are even less than the data shows that that at the Center for Children's Books in Wisconsin. Um, so that's important too, is that being good consumers of information that's given to you means you really need to look carefully at all the information that's being presented. Because CCBC is providing us with a lot of data, but um, people are thinking it's better than it actually is. It really is not that good. Um, my blog, 
I think is important because um, I was a school teacher before I went to graduate school. I couldn't afford to be a member of the associations where you get articles. I couldn't afford to buy books where those that um, chapters are written that could help teachers. So my blog was designed to give people information without a paywall. You know, anybody that has the internet can access anything I have there. A lot of what's there is there because a teacher or a parent wrote to me and said, Debbie, can you please look at this book? So for example, you're talking about The Courage of Sarah Noble. I have not written about that book, but I will now because parents and teachers write to me asking me, can you write up this book so that I can talk to my kid's teacher about it? Um, so that 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 resource is very much a designed for people who are actually working with books in particular with um, people who want to give kids good literature about native people. Uh, I guess I could say many more things. Um, we do have more than we used to, um, but it's still it's still worrisome to me because Right now, you you all probably know that books are being banned right and left across the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, those books that are being banned are primarily um, books by people of color and books by LGBTQ writers. Um, and we seem to be largely missing from the challenged and, and banned book lists, which uh, at first blush, people will say, good. And I'm like, uh-uh. I think we're missing because nobody's reading our books and they don't know what's in them. They still don't know that we exist. And if they did, if, for example, they picked up Sharice's Big Voice, that's a picture book by Sharice Davids, in there she has the word lesbian twice. That would send those moms for liberty off the edge. In there she shows a... <laughs> She shows a soldier holding a gun pointed at some Ho-Chunk people when they were moving the Ho-Chunk people off of their homelands. That too, Moms for Liberty would be saying, you're trying to make my kid feel bad about being an American. Those are the criteria, one of the criteria that they're using to ban books. So our books, I think we have more of them, but they're not that visible. And so people who are here today for this session really should be holding up those books and promoting those books because they need to be visible. They need to be part of everybody's knowledge about children's books in particular. I think I'll stop. Wow, thank you. And I know when I, I approached Debbie to um, be on this panel, the first thing she said was, it sounds really great, but here's a list of authors that I really think that should be on the panel. <laughs> I said, no, I need your voice. <laughs> because, uh, Dr. Reese was so instrumental on how, in how I was able to deal with the school crisis. And thank you so much for bringing up the banned book because um, I wanted to, if we had time and we do have time, is to really, um, is to ask any uh, of our panelists today, what do they think about this sort of national rush to, to ban books and, I think most of our authors here um, talk about these very uh, challenging and difficult topics that most certainly would be right on on cue with um, what did you call them? I don't even know what they're called. Moms, <laughs> the angry, angry mothers. <laughs> Moms for Liberty. It's a very well-funded political conservative. Republican GOP group that um, they, their, their chapters are growing. You can look at their website and they're proliferating across the country and they go to school boards and they read aloud from um, books that they think are problematic. Um, and I want them to be reading aloud from our books. I do. <laughs> right. I and, 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 and you also co-authored the, uh, the indigenous people's history of the United States for young people, right? Mm-hmm. And that that would most most likely be on one of the targeted. I I almost like I feel kind of sketchy even bringing it up. Like I don't I don't want it to like be a be a thing, you know. But at the same time, you're right. Like I feel so Gemini about it, Debbie. Like <laughs> we need to talk about this, um, but I don't want it to to like be on anybody's radar either. Like we're kind of educating under under the radar here. Uh, do you think that your book uh, that you you helped co-author would be on, on the list? That is one exception, that book. And I think it's it's an exception because it's an adaptation of an adult book that people were 
frowning about. So, so our, our book, The Adaptation, is in fact on the banned list, and we do have data showing that it was boxed up and taken away from school libraries in Texas. So our book actually did get banned. <laughs> but when you look at the justification for it being banned, it's like they're cutting and pasting a few sentences and the Moms for Liberty, sticking them on any book. So they didn't read the book. If they did, they would have said, hey, she called George Washington a monster. <laughs> but that's not what their criticism is. It's just nonsense kind of criticism. Um, anyway, our, <laughs> our book did get banned. Um, any any other panelists want to talk about this topic? Um, my style as a writer, and, and it kind of goes back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. Like, um, I just want to go over some obstacles for Indigenous writers that are, uh, for many years, especially when I started out back in um, uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, that it was still considered a niche genre. Um, you know, many Native writers lacked a platform lack the resources to gain leverage to access mainstream publications, competing with non-native writers writing about the same topics. And you know, you could be writing something as an indigenous person and see a non-native person getting a review in the New York Times about your own tribe. And um and so uh those are are, are some of the obstacles and um and and uh and I think experiencing that, you know and going through all the different things I went through as a youth, knowing the pushback against who we are as indigenous people and folks not wanting to come to terms with it. And that's what a lot of this banning is. It's like, they don't want to talk about slavery. They don't want to talk about genocide. You know, it's it's a trigger for them, right? And you know, we always say, when there's a conversation about race, who in the room doesn't want to talk about it? It's white people. And so it's a trigger for them to have to deal with that because dealing with that means accountability. And accountability means you have to do something about it. And so, um, like when I wrote my first book, for example, it was it was a lot of pushback in itself from some of the things I mentioned. So I wanted to prove I can write about, you know, things that have nothing to do with Native people. So if you look at my first book, Tales from the Whispering Basket, there are stories in there that have nothing to do with Indigenous people. I wanted to show my creative breath of writing, and I wanted to show them, this is, I can do that. I don't have to talk about Native people. And so I did that, but I'd rather talk about Native people. So I went back to that in my next book. And um my book, The Morning Road to Thanksgiving, has a lot of powerful and indicting statements on the genocide, on enslavement. And, but being a creative writer, I knew that white consumption may have been too much for. So I spread it out in a way that they kind of like, and I had this thing um, I call accidental learning. And so I wrap these in stories and little narratives and little scenes where they're getting, the, oh, oh, now I know this. So I get it in their head, the stuff that's in my head. And so that's kind of what one of the ways I kind of combat that in my creative style of writing is sharing that history through creative storytelling and um, and getting that message out there. And incidentally, my first book was a, some of the many challenges I was going through as a traditional storyteller. The editors didn't like my style of writing. Well, you can't go past, present and future. You can't do that. I just I can. You know, you can't. And so it was a lot of a lot of conflicting ideology in terms of how we tell story. Right. And so. You know, so we have to kind of be the the authors of that in every sense of the word of how we want to do our traditional style of storytelling and um and also a couple of the stories that are traditional that were in that book. I went to my elders and said, "Can I write about this?" Because that's part of our culture too that some of these stories weren't meant to be written down. So I had to get permission from some of the elders to share some of those stories in there. And so um and I think as Debbie pointed out, we're we're still partially not on the radar in terms of um some of the things that we're sharing about because, you know, yeah, well, the, the natives are cute and we're going to get this, the noble savage or, you know, the heartfelt story where they're going to drop some wisdom on us. And, you know, and I experienced that many times where um, non-native writers will send me their manuscript, you know, without me asking for that, I'll get these manuscripts and they want me to tell them some things. And it's more of a colonial grab and, and to make their books more, more palatable for, for consumption and marketable. And so I just usually ignore it. <laughs> um, but but that's kind of the way I, I dealt with that myself. And I, and I just mentioned lastly that, you know, thinking in terms of the future, and that's kind of why I dove back down uh, uh, as one of the other panelists talked about was during the, the children's writing and um, in the amazing work, I must give a shout out to Bunker Hill Community College because we're really trying to shift that narrative of, of getting that literature out to not only the youth, but in a college level where uh, Bunker Hill Community College has engaged in 
creating a, a, a discipline areas to impact over 20 different disciplines in their school on indigeneity, indigenous knowledge. And you know, the, the quantitative metrics already are that we're, we're hitting 1500 students per semester. And the qualitative data is the testimonies, the reflections, the new curriculum development and the enhancements of study, and that they're getting an opportunity to learn about the people of their land, as, as Chris mentioned earlier, that you know they don't have to think that we're gone because they're learning about it in school. It's not an elective anymore. It's required reading. And you know, you want to graduate from college, you learn about the tribe that the land that you're benefiting from. And so that's a lot of the shift that we need to see happening. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And that is also part of the mass indigenous agenda yes. is making sure that there is accurate and relevant curriculum regarding uh, Massachusetts state tribes uh, so that that is taught in our elementary schools. Um, well, our public schools, yes. not just elementary schools, high schools, middle schools as well. Um, so that's very important. Um, and I know, um, Chris, you have you're working on another book mm -hmm. coming up for Scholastic. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the, the, the book, If You Live During the Plymouth Thanksgiving, is actually the uh, beginning of a rewrite of a series of books that Scholastic began in the 70s, uh, written all by one author. Uh, if you lived, uh, you know, during the, the original was if you lived during the first Thanksgiving, uh, which Scholastic was so embarrassed about, they wouldn't even show me a, a copy of to have a guide. Uh, they, they wanted something new. Um, you know, by, by doing this. And um, yeah, uh, you know, in, um, in writing it, you know, the, uh, working with a company like Scholastic, it, as even, even when they want to do uh, diversity work, sometimes you, you still run into um, things that, that, that they balk against, uh, because of fear of, of public reaction. Uh, you know, so I sourced some of the material from Frank James' uh, suppressed speech from from the 1970s. If you don't know that story, um, in uh, um, in the 1970s, the town of Plymouth invited a Wampanoag speaker, Frank James, Frank Wasada James, uh, to speak mm -hmm. at the 350th anniversary of the Mayflower, and he had a very truth-telling speech that he was going to tell. Uh, they looked at it, and they wouldn't allow him to speak. Uh, it ended up getting republished uh, later on. It's now part of the collection at the, the, the Smithsonian. Um, you know, so it, uh, that was, you know, my homage, uh, you know, to these truths. And uh, uh, oftentimes the, the reaction, uh, the neg if people do have a negative reaction, you know, um, it, it's oftentimes to a piece of truth. Uh, I include facts in there like uh, the U.S. Um, uh, legal basis for ownership of land, of native land, is the doctrine of discovery that was created by the, the Catholic Church in 1493. And, you know, so if you look at my one-star reviews, it, it's, you know, how can that be? The U.S., no, that's a, that can't be true, but it is true. Um, you know, the Marshall decision, Supreme Court, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg even cited it herself. Um, you know, so these these are um, things that people balk against. Um, but uh, the way my, my approach to it was uh, I was contracted for 8,500 words. Uh, what I ended up turning in was 15,000 words because there was just too much that I felt uh, had to be included. And I wanted to make sure to cut off any of those arguments ahead of time, uh, you know, with actual facts. Uh, you know, and uh, so that way that when uh, when people come away, they have a, a, a better experience. And, you know, uh, and to Debbie's point, you know, the, the story of Wampanoag history is not my story. Uh, you know, so my intention uh, all along with this particular project was not to please Scholastic. It was not to please a non-Native audience. It was to please Wampanoag people who experienced that same thing at Plymouth Patuxent Museum, where people come up and say, I'm surprised you're still here. Um, you know, so I wanted something that the communities would be proud to say, no, this is a good starting point, you know, because I'm tired of telling this story to you over and over and over here, use this instead. And, you know, to, um, uh, you know, uh, my delight, um, thankfully, uh, the Wampanoag communities, uh, you know, and uh, I work with Linda Coombs uh, as my uh, subject matter expert, who is a very hard grader, by the way, which is exactly what I wanted um, <clears throat> uh, to make sure uh, that uh, you know the the communities would would uh, would want to use it, and that's essentially what's happened. Is that you can see it sold at the Mashpee Museum as well as the Aquinnah Cultural Center. Um, you know, so uh, the 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 starred reviews that that um, uh, were mentioned before. I actually, I, I was so raw to this process when the School Library Journal gave me a starred review. I didn't even know what the star was about. <laughs> <laughs> My friend that worked at Scholastic told me, "Oh, you got a star." I was like, "Oh, what does that mean?" You know. 
So, um, it, it wasn't about the stars for me. I, I really could care less about that. It was about uh, making sure that Wampanoag people felt uh, that their stories were being uh, told respectively. And that means truth. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think what I would like to do now is ask each of our panelists really to take a moment um, to give words of wisdom and encouragement um, to any indigenous listeners out there um, who think that they can't write or that they won't get published or you know anything, any uh, books that you feel are up and coming or should be you know, part of our, our collective radar. So I'll start with you, Eric, putting you in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think the, the kind of time tested advice for for writers you know um and you, know, you just keep hearing it over and over and over again and it was even advice that i that i thought i was rejecting um is, is to write what you know so if in fact you are tied you know to your community and you're like you're really if, if your cultural heritage is enmeshed in your life in some meaningful way as a writer um, you know, it's it's going to come out, and at the same time, though, you you want to learn your craft, and uh, you know, and I did, I was not a, a hobbyist reader either. I think I started reading um, for pleasure in high school, but not because I liked the books, um, but because I liked horror movies, and the only ways to re-experience them was to read like this really kind of terrible novelizations. Um, because it was like the pre-VCR era, so I'm kind of a geezer in that way. And so like the only way to re-experience a horror movie was to read the novelization. That's where I began reading. And then I discovered um, Stephen King in the process because I thought Salem's Lot was a novelization for a movie I had just seen. Didn't know it was a, was a novel. And uh, and then I, I was, I discovered, you know, how awesome it was, but also that that it seemed very much like the res to me. Salem's Lot takes place in a really, really small, somewhat gossipy, closed community. And I thought, oh, that seems very familiar to me. Um, and the first novel I wrote in, in college, and I finished it when I was about 20, 21. And I, my creative writing professor I recently, so, you know, we remain friends for the rest of uh, his life, who recently passed. Um, he graciously read it and he said, wow, you know, that was a really fascinating novel about, about the res, but what were those monsters doing in there? And I had no idea that I had in fact written about the res, but because my entire life was enmeshed in that culture, it, it, it you know, that was in fact what I had written about. And that I think, um, you know, that kind of set me on my course. And he also, because he was way better read than me said there's a brand new novel that's just come out and you know you should really check it out i think because i didn't want to tell you while you were working on this he said i thought you should you know be charting your own path as you're going but now that you're done with the first draft you should read this i think it's a great beautiful book and might help you he said it's called love medicine and so love medicine had literally just come out in the year that i was working on what turned out to be a pretty terrible horror novel that will never see the light of day but um but it was the beginning of the process, and uh, and then I and I saw in in Louise's work, you know what what was possible, and to imagine all these years later that I'm now participating in that conversation seemed ludicrous to me at 19, and uh, and and I've been doing it professionally for a really long time now, but because I believed in in the worth of our stories. And so I guess believe in the worth of your story. That's my very short version of like a long bit of advice. No, oh, thank you. That that's a very important piece of advice is believing in yourself. And uh, Morgan, is, do we have Morgan? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, okay, there we are. Yeah, no, I would I would echo a lot of what what Eric said. Um, you know, I think you know believing in your stories, and I think I think the big thing too is like. 
obviously write what you know, but I think there's a really, it's really important to write, you know, if you're going to write about, you know, your, your culture, right. Do it as specifically as possible, not for, you know, not for, you know, the market or for anything like that, but like, we really need stories that are tribally specific. You know, I feel like for so long, and even today to a degree, you know, the book, the, the indigenous literature we see out there is like about Indian country. You know what I mean? Like there's this, con like we can talk about these books in the context of Indian country, which is good, but they sometimes we can fall short in our conversations about, oh, let's, you know, talk about this book in the context of Penobscot history or in the context of, you know, Hopi history. So I, I feel like, you know, being specific is like such an important aspect of writing. Um, and the other thing, you know, I will say is to keep writing, <laughs> you know, it take, you know, if, if you're a storyteller, you're, it's going to take a long time to, to tell your stories. You know, I, I tell people this all the time, you know, you know, I didn't get a story, you know, story, I didn't publish a story for, for nine years, you know, it took me nine years to, to publish a story in a magazine that actually never even made its way to me that I never even seen, <laughs> never saw. Um, and so you need, it takes patience, it takes time. Um, but writing, you, you know, writing a story is, is entering an act of, of the sacred and you have to really, you know, have that patience, that, that determination, that diligence and, um, I always, oh, discipline. That's, oh, the, I always forget the word discipline yet. It's like the most important part. Um, you need the discipline to do it, um, but don't quit. That's the biggest thing is don't quit telling stories because the moment you quit telling stories is the moment we stop living. Ooh, that's really powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Debbie, do you have any authors that uh, we should be seeing? Anyone that is... Um, up and coming um there that's too big a question i think yes there yeah, there are right, good. and i'm not and i'm not going to name them because i want people to just come to my website and click the best books tab and you'll start to see some of that you could follow me on twitter because i'm sharing a lot of information there as well i'm deb reese on twitter so you can find me there i'm really glad that morgan talked about being tribally specific because we really need to do that um, I really like what Chris said about working on that book that's not his nation but he worked with people of that nation and I and I think that's really important is that and it, and it points to a problem that that I see quite a lot is um, uh, people who are disconnected or that were um, taken from their nations and um, somehow know that story or maybe not sometimes it's just somebody's great 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 grandmother but the idea that someone believes that they are native and then they start to write stories about that people and they really haven't reestablished connections with that community um, and what they end up contributing is a lot of uh, stereotypical romantic kind of stories that doesn't serve us well because it's not tribally specific. Um, so I'm, 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 this is a, especially a difficult problem right now because we have so many conversations going on about ethnic fraud and ra uh, race shifting and pretendianism um, because the market is hot for native writing. And so we do have native people writing and, and doing right by who they are and who their nations are. And we have a lot of people who are like cherry picking and doing all kinds of things that are not okay. So um up and coming writers that's a tough one there are some but they'll get elbowed out by the fakers so it's important to know who you're reading and who you're recommending thank you for bringing that that up i think it's really important to understand what's been happening in the last few years about race shifting and uh distorted descent um some different um topics that are, are coming up about indigeneity and folks who have misrepresented themselves, um, sometimes innocently and sometimes not so innocently. Uh, so it's really important that when you're looking for an author, that they know who their community is and that community accepts them back. 
that's the bare minimum. Um, other than that, you know, thank you so much. And your website does have different tabs, so you can go uh, by genre and taking a look at your best books. I love, 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 love reading the best books of the year. Oh my gosh, I'm such a nerd. I buy most of them. So <laughs> anytime, anytime I see this, I'm, I'm like, I have this problem. I should be. Um, uh, my name is Rhonda, and I'm a bookaholic. <laughs> that should be my thing, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> one, um, one more thing I can say about my blog and the best books and the work that I do really recommend is that Native kids need mirrors. And so I really emphasize realistic or modern fiction. Um, and so um, uh, historical fiction, I don't do as much, but I also find that Native writers aren't really doing that much historical fiction for kids. They're all creating the kinds of books they wanted when they were growing up. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I, I, I even have somewhere in here, and I, I probably will I find it. I don't know because I have bookmarked so many pages in this poor book. <laughs> Apple's uh, skin to the core. There was one little. A sentence, right? You just summed it up for me. And here it is. So again, Apple Skin to the Core by Eric, uh, page 103. It's the very last sentences of um, Wyatt Wingfoot ends up singing that same old song. And I'm going to start half sentence here. Quote, and because I know this comic is from 1968, what I really want to know is, when do I get to see the Indians as the superheroes, not as the super hapless? When are we the victors, not the victims? How much longer do I have to wait? End quote. So I think I'm going to end there. We are just about right up on our time. If we have any uh, question from our immediate audience of our panelists, I will take one question. We have less than five minutes. So do we, do we have anything? Do we have anything online? No? Okay. Any questions here in the audience? Yes, Dennis. saying to Faith that we all know that the greatest religious fiction is our American history. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why we really want the real writers and the real storytellers telling the real story because there's so much ugliness attached to it. It really dehumanized mm -hmm. who we were and what we did. So I, I really am, am grateful that I was able to come to this today. I'm I'm grateful that you're here. It gave me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, I appreciate everyone who's tuning in in the the web world and who will be watching this. This will be um, recorded and saved and archived through the generosity of HowlRound. Um, thank you to our amazing panelists uh, for sharing their stories. <laughs> I want to say thank you, thank you to Double Edge for being the the, the true co-conspirators and um, providing this safe place for Indigenous voices to be heard. Um, and our our partnership is invaluable. So Koyanakpak, thank you so much, um, and thank you members of the audience for coming out on this gorgeous Sunday um, and just partaking in active listening. 
right? Because active listening is the key to making changes, to making, um, to understanding and knowing what those changes are that need to be made. So koyanak nalak nagivsi. Thank you for listening. Tabra, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>